58 years ago, in a series of lectures delivered at the University of Sussex, the British historian Hugh Trevor Ropper stated emphatically, perhaps in the future there will be some African history to teach, but at present there is none, only the history of Europeans in Africa. The rest is largely darkness, and darkness is not a subject of history. Beneath his dismissal of the whole non-European era is the belief that writing is superior to speech and that written histories are more valuable than oral. I'm sitting here at the AFI Bureau with Nat Nunuamatifu, who is often described as a walking encyclopedia and holds the histories of Accra's urban development. He's a trained architect and historian and is also a former mayor of the city. Uncle Nat, I'm delighted to have you here and thank you for being with us. Thank you very much. And you'll be talking to us today about the city of Plans, Accra. So I'll kick off with our first question on the sighting of the capital city. This was conceived as a very precise strategic process and um, Accra's administrative capital in 1877. What was the basis for this repositioning? Um, the British had a seat in Cape Coast and also in Jamestown here in Accra. Uh, and then going on to the towards the east. Now, there were several reasons for the shift. Of course, the Ashanti wars were still raging, uh, pausing until the 1870s, that Ashanti was more or less defeated. But the two principal reasons that I have figured out is, geographically, Accra laid right in the center of the coastline from one end of the Gold Coast, as it was then, in the east, to its end in the west. The British did not control the whole place, but they had seats of power alongside it. And Accra lay right in the center of the stretch. Uh, the British administrators were headquartered in Cape Coast, because that was the seat of the British administration then. But they covered the whole area. For example, there was no chief justice, there was a position called the judicial assessor. And he traveled from one jurisdiction to the other, administering mm. justice in the British style courts. And it was obvious that coming from Cape Coast, to travel all the way to the other end and back, stretch their facilities. Whereas if justice was dispensed in Accra, it cuts this in mm. two. So that was partly mm. the reason. Not only the judicial assessor, but other functionaries who worked mm. for the British. For the British. But the more importantly, Cape Coast was politically very vibrant. Don't forget they had several newspapers, they had several schools, mm -hmm. they had a relatively more educated population mm -hmm. who were politically very active. In the 1850s, the British had tried to 
create a law which would entitle European settlers mm. to buy land in the settlement. Mm. And that had led to quite an uproar. It had activated sentiments which eventually led to the creation of the Aboriginal, Aboriginal Rights right. Protection Society. So Cape Coast was quite feverish. And so at a time when the British were thinking about relocating the capital, capital those were very important considerations. Accra was relatively quiescent. There was a political class here, but they were not as litigious <laughs> as the class in Kekos that was constantly mm. suing the British for one thing or the other. Geographically also, Accra was flatter. It was not as mountainous mm. here. And was judged to be healthier. Uh, the Europeans in Cape Coast and Elmina seem to have a harder time adjusting to the environment than the ones here. And then finally, Accra also had the benefit of the Aburi escarpment with its high landscape and cool temperatures, which the Europeans could take advantage of. So all these were reasons why Accra was judged. It was not the only one considered. Accra, uh, well, Cape Coast was considered for the permanent uh, capital, capital, as well as uh, Accra, and then I think Pram Pram That's interesting. was also in the works. Mm -hmm. But Accra was settled upon. Mm -hmm. For the reasons of the centrality you just talked about. Yes. Mm -hmm. The centrality and also the political the activity. Political, yes, yes. All right. Yeah. So, which geographical extents defined Accra before the 1940s leading up to? Well, we also used Accra as it is today. It's kind of difficult to throw one's mind because Accra was simply a collection of villages. Uh, centered in old Accra now, a collection of villages. But the Ghans lived as far as Nungwa, okay, Teshi Nungwa. Uh, the Dutch and the Danes had been here up to the 1850s. So it wasn't like a Tabula Rosa, like a clean slate for the British. They had other powers to contend with. The girl lived here, but of course, by the time we are talking about, the British were also here with their own ideas of what the city should be like. There were a lot of migrants from Cape Coast, from Elmina, foreigners, from Nigeria. Mm -hmm. So it was a very mixed bag of population. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Accra was really defined by constant negotiation mm -hmm. among its mm -hmm. constituent parts. Uh, people came, they settled, mm -hmm. and their settlements grew, mm -hmm. and Lagos town obviously, mm. the name implies. Uh, even traditional areas like Jamestown mm -hmm. had its constituent ethnic areas. Mm -hmm. uh, and these are settlements started by people of a particular group who are then joined by friends and relatives and it grows. Mm. So, a lot of Accra grew like that. Uh, Accra had also 
up before that time be invaded and incorporated some of the invaders into their mm -hmm. demographics. And you can tell by their names, like mm -hmm. Usu Alata, Ngrisi mm -hmm. Alata, uh, Akuma Aje. Mm -hmm. Now, that's a name I find fascinating because that came after the uh, Akwamu invasion mm -hmm. of Accra. I've always thought the name was Akuma Jane. Mm -hmm. Recently, somebody pointed out to me that it could also be Akan Me Ajay. Mm. Akan. For the Akan. Mm. Me mm. Ajay. So right. the Akan literal translation of Sure. Mm. Uh, I'm not quite sure. I don't know the veracity of that, but it sounds very plausible. Mm. Mm. Because when the Akomo conquered Accra, they established place, Otublo Hum. Mm -hmm. Otublo Hum was the diplomatic quarter mm. of old Accra, where the Akwamu businessmen and foreigners had their townhouses. Mm. And Otu was the son of the king of Akwamu, who came here as the viceroy, as mm -hmm. its governor. So, you see how the city yes. incorporated yes. it? Yes. 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 So there were all of these structures in place. Um, yes. The histories of the place did not begin with the coming of colonial Oh, powers. no, it did not. It did not. It was just very much mm. advantage of the British mm. to, uh, to behave as if they began the mm -hmm. history of this place, mm -hmm. but it did not. Mm -hmm. And they started with a history of forts and settlements to enhance their commercial activities. Well, they did, and their forts and settlements had a huge impact in the formation of mm -hmm. the city. Mm -hmm. Because up to the forts and settlements came, Accra, as I said, was a collection of clan gatherings, clan holdings. You go to the different portions, clans and families are settled. Mm -hmm. The forts started appearing in the 1650s and first it was the Dutch Osha Fort, mm -hmm. then the Usu Castle, it was first built by the Swedes mm -hmm. about 10-15 years after Osha Fort. Then James Fort, that was built in 1674, on the other end. Now, each of those forts were built by African mm. artisans and laborers. The plans may have come from Europe, but there were not the enough Europeans mm. to build. They didn't survive long enough. So they used African workmen. And these workmen built their houses around the forts and they lived there and then went to work and came back home. Mm -hmm. That literally was the beginning of the Jamestown. Mm -hmm. Now when the fort was completed, the habitation naturally turned out into a township. It had a lot of advantages because each of these townships around the forts became the preferred middlemen for the trade with the fort. The Europeans at that time in the 17th century had found it very difficult to enter into, into the country mm -hmm. because there were hardly any roads and it kind of dangerous and none of the local chiefs wanted them wandering around. Mm -hmm. Of course, that was also the period of the slave trade. Of course. So if you saw any whites, you knew they were up to no good. So they stayed in their forts, mm. and it was the Africans who did much of the work. Mm. 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 That somehow transmitted to the idea of 
European sovereignty over the land. But there was nothing there was like nothing that. Nothing like that. Mm. Even though the Europeans created the focus mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. these settlements, mm -hmm. which redefined Accra. Mm -hmm. Because one, apart from being a broad mm -hmm. uh, landscape of different groups living together, it was now segmented into mm -hmm. these three particular points. At first, the colonial powers, I mean, they didn't come here as a political organization. They came here as traders. And as traders, they had limited interest in the country. Their main interest is what can we get out of it? And how can we export what we get out of it? And how can we trade with it? Okay. They were depending on their local partners to provide the infrastructure of trade. This, and of course, because the three were in competition, the Dutch, the English, and the Danes, they could hardly cooperate to create the infrastructure mm -hmm. that fed mm -hmm. the coast. It was after the departure of the Dutch, of the Dutch and the Danes mm -hmm. when the British got quote unquote undisputed, not control, but they were the main trading mm -hmm. hub mm -hmm. that all that started to change because then they realized that they needed to be put a structure right. on what mm -hmm. they were doing here. And to do so, they needed royal patronage. Well, they already had royal patronage with their kings, but they also needed a more formal relationship with the local kings. Mm -hmm. So that's when all that mm -hmm. started to reform itself. And from that period, where do we go next? Osu was bombed by fish because the people of Osu refused to accept coming under British rule. They had been with the Danes for generations and worked out a way of existence. The British came and of course the British wanted to tax them in order to provide the infrastructure. And they said no. So they attacked the castle mm -hmm. and a British warship lying off the coast bombed Osu. <laughs> okay. Uh, Accra was also bombed. So there was some reaction mm -hmm. before all this came under uh, British control. British control. Yes. Mm -hmm. Was there a template for what Accra was envisaged to look like under the Fry and Drew plan? I have not seen mm -hmm. what they did elsewhere, but they were colonial. They were not civil servants, but they were operating at a particular time in world history. They represented certain viewpoints. Yes, that's true. They were quite I believe in their own way, they believed they were sympathetic to the African cause, but they were Europeans of a particular time. And their view of an urban landscape was shaped by what they had been brought up on, okay, and what they had seen. So I assume that much of their work would contain these elements, broad boulevards, parks, tree-lined avenues, uh, you know. Nkrumah's view of development was different. Mm. I mean, he's a son of the soil. He recognized that he had to develop the country. So his interest is, what can we do to reshape this city to make it 
possible ways for us to develop. Obviously, you need a port. Uh, you need to get energy. You need to get infrastructure, roads, mm. to bring stuff here. Gordon Gagesberg had built Takradi Harbour in the 1920s mm. when Britain needed the extractive commodities and it was easier to get it from Takwa, mm -hmm. come all the come way all the down, way down. to Takradi that had a better harbour facilities uh, than here. So he quite sensibly built mm -hmm. there. But Kume's idea was to make Accra a modern industrial city. And for that reason, he chose Tema. Mm. And since he was very interested in, in developing a second level, developing commodities, rather than selling the raw commodities, let's bring it to at that level. Mm. You needed a lot of energy for that. So Tema was planned to be the location for or this industrial area. Mm -hmm. It was equipped with electricity from mm -hmm. Dakosumbu to do so. Mm -hmm. So that changed the direction that they plan. You've touched on a very interesting aspect of Tema as its own independent township. Um, when did that breakaway happen? 1988. Mm -hmm. At first it was the Accra Tema Town Council. Uh, of course, that was when Nkrumah fell, a lot of the ideas that he tried to implement were jettisoned, thrown out. They must have been, had some good reasons, but uh, planning is a political act. It's not a disinterested act of intellection, but you must have an aim in mind. You must have a goal. And to do so, you must weigh political considerations and decide that, okay, if I'm going to achieve my political considerations, this is the route I have to follow. This is the infrastructure I have to lay down. Akuna, spatially, what are the extents of present-day Accra as we see it? That's one of those difficult questions because of the recent uh, gerrymandering that has gone mm. on. But when I was there, Nungwa was one, Malam was the other, beyond Medina, mm -hmm. that is, mm -hmm. uh, the Atlantic Ocean. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Those cardinal extents. Yes. Mm -hmm. And all of these fit into the. And the all of these sub metros fitted into it. Mm. Mm. Were the key points of departure from this original plan for the city so wide? Well, it was wide, but it's not that wide. It's just that uh, when another group takes over government, they come with their own agenda of what they want to do. All right. Uh, they come with their own tribal memories of who have been neglected and who have not been neglected. And they come there to try to recalibrate the system to make it more equitable in their eyes. So they are bound to expunge or at least reduce some elements that we take for granted since we are beneficiaries of it. Eh? Uh, free education, for one thing. The British, when they were in control of this country, literally neglected the North. 
Nkrumah, when he came, saw a political, a political advantage. And he really went out of his way to woo the North, mm -hmm. to the extent that he made the uh, Batakali, the dress that he and his ministers wore on state occasions to show his continuity mm -hmm. with the Northern region. Mm, in alignment. Mm. He instituted also the free education from kindergarten up to university. And a lot of that still is on the books because it was very much issued his political purposes. Mm. The problem is, however, once these purposes are put into place, how do you get away from it? Mm. That's a, bit, a difficult one. And same thing with planning. So you have a natural convergence of these two, you know, almost separate acts. And um, like you said, you can look at the act of master planning almost in isolation, but then it is connected. Well, it's very, mm. very connected. Mm. It will be an act of political mismanagement if mm -hmm. you don't see that the pretty pictures that are presented to you as your proposals for master plan are nothing but they are pretty pictures, but they impinge upon the lives of real people. Mm -hmm. They create real ambitions. Mm -hmm. They create serious disappointments. So they must be guided into implementation for which you need infrastructure, new laws, etc. etc. We've had a history of appointed mayors right. to the positions mm. of um, um, ju having jurisdictional control mm. over the city planning. Mm -hmm. um, obviously within your position, within your experience as mayor of Accra within a, a period of time, I'm sure there's a lot of collaboration that is necessary for planning for well, absolutely. Accra is not, it's not a sovereign state. It's not a jurisdiction independent of the larger jurisdiction. It is part of a country. Its policies flow from the policies of the central government. I must recognize that in order to be effective is funded by the central government. Many of its key personnel are seconded to AMA from the central government. Consequently, the city mm. has to be very conscious of the central government and its comings and goings. I feel that the government should have enough confidence in the citizens of the city to allow them to choose their own leader. But, like I said, a lot will have to go into uh, that responsibility. I mean, how do you fund the city mm -hmm. after all? The city must have its own ways of raising money mm -hmm. through taxation and whatever means. Mm. Uh, as we sit now, Accra does not have that ability. Mm. Uh, much of the money that funds Accra comes through monies collected by the central government mm. and then fed into Accra. Local governments. Sure, the mm. local government. Mm. Yeah. And then that brings us to the point where you have now the distinctions of the various districts separate from Accra, but all under the Greater Accra Metropolitan. You know. Yes, area. it uh, decentralisation. I think it's gone too far. I really believe it's gone too far because uh, I mean, you talk about. Sanitation in Accra. It's not only a question of what do you do around Abu Gucci Market, around uh, 
macula or whatever. But it's the Odo River coming from mm -hmm. the outer reaches of Accra that brings a lot of the filth down into the city. It's an increasing urbanization of people, mm -hmm. the spread of the city. People coming down to work, to work in the city and then to go back. Right now, people uh, live very far outside Accra and come to work to, here mm. during the day. So it's much bigger than that. Mm. Uh, but ever since Kwame Hoy and Rollins came up with this idea of decentralization, which was a good idea at its time, too many people were outside the loop. Uh, so they deliberately created a local government structure to rope in as many people into governance as possible. Uh, and they did succeed. But I have a feeling now that mm -hmm. it's gone beyond mm -hmm what they probably envisioned. You've spoken about the issue of the waterways, the water bodies of Accra. Sure. When was the first legible plan for a place like Kuali Lagu? I assume that Fry and Drew's plan would... Were catered for? Uh, yeah, would have uh, uh, some emphasis there, but I can't bring it to mind. Okay. The Kuali Lagoon Ecological Restoration Project mm. That was supposed to oversee the sanitation exercise for the colleague. Was this part of a larger plan? Yes. One government? Mm -hmm. It was. Well, the master plans, by their definition, they, these, these are instruction manuals for execution. And um, in chronicling this development um, spatially of Accra, um, how precisely did we go about following the various um, spatial development frameworks and master plans. They had papers to guide. They do not always have a timeline which says you start from point A and you go to point B, A, C, D. Okay? Those are the decisions made by government on the spot at the mm -hmm. time, considering other uh, responsibilities that they have. So your question presupposes that there are no mm -hmm. uh, disturbances along the line, but there are always, always disturbances. Are. Mm -hmm. There are famines, there are floods, there are all kinds of things that divert government's mm -hmm. attention. I mean, for the last one and a half years, we've had COVID. COVID had had a huge impact upon our economy, about our, on our planning, etc., etc. We have not even had a time mm. to look at how COVID mm. affected us so, mm. okay? Mm. But in another couple of years, we'll have enough hindsight to analyze that. And then you see that uh, it had an impact, it changed some plans. When was um, the Land Use and Spatial Planning Authority um, set up and for what reason? It was set up to control the profligate land use in the city. Uh, it was set up to put some kind of control over how the land was used uh, people were building houses in the middle of roads. Mm, waterways. Mm. Waterways. And every time that it rained and the neighborhood gets flooded, everybody points to that house, which, mm. okay? Unfortunately, sometimes too many people have settled in there and it becomes very difficult to uproot it. But there you go. Uh, 
There's constant interruptions. Mm -hmm. Yes. Accra's history of, just like you said, disrupted planning. And not all of them due to conscious decisions to interrupt the plan, but like you said, natural progressions, natural disasters, occurrences. Beyond and sometimes control. very deliberate plans, actions to not disrupt, because to disrupt presupposes you knew what was supposed to be there. But the lack of enforcement, because when a house is being built, the city authorities know that something is happening there. Of course, they are supposed to have functionaries on the ground to report when anything new starts happening. Sometimes they do, I suppose they do, but the enforcement doesn't always mm. occur. Mm. Okay. What were those um, plans to sort of integrate the services of um, the city into a larger services plan for storm drainage, for instance? We have the, the main basin, um, the Odo, um, which empties directly into the Kole. Sure. Mm. And we have a collection system which should sort of work hand in hand, be integrated into the planning of the city. Do you think that for the better part of the, the development of Accra, this has been the case? But you don't forget that Accra is growing fast. Within the last 20 years, the city has grown exponentially. And the plans that I recall did not envisage such a rapid growth. Not only a growth in population, but a growth in the hard surfaces. Mm. Anytime it rains, the rain hits the ground, seeps into the ground, goes into the subterranean rain system, water. When you build a house on top or you put concrete yard, you stop that. The water collects, you have to find a way out, and then the flooding starts. So, all these plans have been made, mm -hmm. but it was done without... Well, we did anticipate a growth in the population. We did anticipate a growth in the fiscal demands upon the landscape. But the numbers has thrown everybody off. The, the issue of enforcement, at which doorstep does this lie? The City Metropolitan Authority. Those are that the statutory body that's supposed to ensure the enforcement of these rules. But as I told you, maybe I didn't, every planning action is a political action. So anytime you try to stop somebody, they can go over your head. There's no excuse but to tell you that it's not a smooth, straightforward resolution of yes. okay but it has been negotiated quite a bit mm. the process of broad stakeholder engagement who are the main actors um, beyond the main political powers Ahoy introduced the cadres the local cadres who are supposed to be with the watchdogs of different communities to see when there is a church making too much noise. Mm. If somebody is building on a waterway. So all these were put in place. Mm -hmm. And for a while I suppose they worked. But then events overtook them. What events are you The growth of the to? city. The growth of the city, okay. The uh, rolling city's government, but it was also a political government, despite its military mm. 
credentials. And in the beginning, in its innocence, it could state down rules, do this or else. But then eventually, politics caught up with it. They have to temporize, they have to negotiate. And that was that. Mm. Presently, there are these shifts from the traditional understandings of master planning um, to breakaways where you are talking about local planning or local structural plans and um, segregated master plans. For instance, the uh, Marine Drive project, which is being planned by um, the firm AG Associates um, and which has been you know, constantly proposed by even other firms. Do you think this is a better approach? Well, it's not either or. They have, there's obviously an attempt to get local input into the planning process. It's all part of the idea of decentralizing government, that people within the community, however it's defined, would have a better idea of what their needs are. But there's also the reality is that their needs have to be congruent mm. with the needs of the next community. Mm -hmm. So you don't build a wall over a waterway Absolutely. and then prevent the water from the next community going, flowing through. So as much as these decentralized communities are supposed to have a certain amount of leeway. It's within a larger context mm -hmm. and we should never forget that. Mm -hmm. That probably is the most apt description for where Accra sits right now. Well, that's not entirely true because mm -hmm. you still have a regional minister. Mm -hmm. uh, up to the current one, I have not really heard too much of the activities of his predecessors. But it's quite obvious that the current regional minister is stepping up to play the role you just described mm. Mm. of being the master coordinator. Coordinating. Mm. Uh, it's early days yet, so we'll see how far he can go. Some would say the vision to realize a cohesive city for Accra is probably unattainable. I don't think it's unattainable. I mean, cities have histories. Paris did not spring from somebody's mind to be what it is now. There were civil wars in Paris, okay? When the government sent in to go and crush mm -hmm. rebels who have taken over particular communities. So many cities have gone through fairly tumultuous times. And transformations. And transformations. Mm -hmm. London, same thing. Yes. New York. Work its route, but gradually they learn. It's not over yet, they are still struggling. I mean, Ring Road was supposed to be the belt beyond which you would have nothing but farmland mm. and a few industrial areas. Mm. That's why the industrial area was placed mm. where it was. But Accra overgrew that. Thank you very much, Uncle. You are welcome. <laughs>